welcome back to my channel. Uh, in this video, and it might well be I'll have to do this over a couple of videos, so we'll see if we get on, I would like to review um, this book. Um, it's called Autism, A New Introduction to Psychological Theory and Current Debates, written by Sue Fletcher Watson and Francesca Happe. And it's actually um, a, a rewriting of the original book that was published in 1994. And obviously a lot has changed since then in terms of autism understanding and awareness. Um, so the book has been rewritten to and updated with all the new th information that's come to light since then. Um, this edition um, was published in 2009. Um, so it covers all the main psychological theory. This book is aimed at academics primarily, um, but it's not as impenetrable um, as some academic books, although I'm not you know, an academic scientist myself, and I'm not a psychology undergraduate, um, I found it reasonably easy to understand. Um, but again, again, I have kind of trained myself in a lot of uh, scientific theory anyway, as I've read um, a huge amount of uh, stuff about autism over the years, some quite kind of technical stuff. So I kind of, um, yeah, so I thought it, it, it didn't come across as too difficult for me. But, um, it was still heavy reading. It wasn't cheap. Um, it was quite expensive. This book, you could probably get it from your library, but I'm not using a library at the moment because of COVID. I, so I have to buy my books at the moment. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting read. So I would like to um, just go over some of the things that I found most interesting in this book, really. Um, so what, uh, one of the things I found most interesting, which is on page... Oh, yeah, page 19, uh, was the, um, the different, um, where it talks about the different presentations, the different manifestations um, of autism that were described by uh, Dr. Lorna Wing. Her, um, she was the person, a psychiatrist, who first uh, coined the term the autism spectrum um, back in the 80s. And um, she, uh, she um, suggested that autistic children could be put into different kind of subgroups. Not, these aren't kind of like technically scientific. Um, it's a very loose kind of informal way of kind of describing the different presentations. Um, for example, aloof. These children were described as being either aloof and indifferent in all situations or as making social contact in order to satisfy a need but then retreating immediately. Passive, this group accepted social contact, but did not seek it out. In a playground, for example, they might be given a role in a play scenario, but require direction from their non-autistic peers to sustain it. And finally, active but odd, these children did approach others to engage in social interaction, but did so in an atypical way. A consequence of their peculiar behaviour was that they were sometimes rejected by their peers, an early flag for the fact now increasingly recognised that the responses of non-autistic children play a key role in the experience and adaptation of autistic children. And here we have um, an illustration, I don't know if you can see it, but an illustration of Lorna Wing's aloof passive odd subtypes um, in the book as well. Um, so we have, yeah, the aloof, the child is just standing there, the woman is trying to approach a child but the child isn't showing any interest. The passive, the woman is just placing the child on the chair, the child isn't reacting or um, trying to get away, very passive, and then we've got the odd, but the child goes right up to someone and like is kind of touching them, and that's reproduced for me to 5th, 1989. And I thought that was really interesting because I definitely, as a child, fell very much into the active but odd subgroup primarily. Um, I actively tried at times to approach other people, but I did so in a very intrusive inappropriate way I was definitely the child who went up to other people like the child in a picture I actually used to go up to complete random strangers in the high side um in the high street and touch them um like literally touch them like and also when I was on a bus as a child I would like stroke the person sitting in front of me I'd be like stroking their hair and they would be turning around and giving me like you know obviously <laughs> very pissed off looks um as I would be incredibly pissed off now as an adult if a child was doing that repeatedly um but I just I didn't understand why it was inappropriate I, I didn't get why the person was annoyed 
um, their feelings didn't resonate with me, I didn't have the empathy, so I just would carry on touching their hair because I enjoyed, I found the reaction funny, I didn't understand it. And also, um, I would often, like, as a child in a playground, I, I would often, like, run through other kids' play, um, they would then give chase, and I would just find it very funny, like, you know, like, obviously they're running after me because they're annoyed with me, but I just saw it as a funny game, so I'd be running really fast and finding it really funny. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, I was active but odd, um, in that, in a sense that I did actively, like, approach kids, and um, I and I did um, as I got older. I did show a kind of desire to seek kids out, like when I was in playgrounds and stuff. So I would be actively approaching them, but I didn't have the understanding of how relationships worked. So beyond the initial kind of like introductions, the actual maintenance of like trying to stay friends with someone was really difficult for me. So I was I was basically a loner a lot of the time and on my own or annoying other kids. But yeah, very much active but odd. As I was the active but odd kid. Um, as I've grown older. Um, I'm obviously a lot, I'm not, you know, I've developed, um, and I've actually, I would say, probably become a bit more, a little bit more aloof maybe as I've got older, but I still, I still try and, like, seek people out, it's just, but I have developed in the sense that, obviously, I now know more about, like, social rules, more of the explicit social rules than I did as a child, but I still don't understand the unwritten social rules. I still, that really still confuses me, and I still have no idea how to really keep relationships going, or really what relationships are, and that still eludes me. But yeah, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, and another interesting thing, I thought, was the definition of autism, how we describe autism on page 23 where it says that even where autism is accompanied by a high IQ and fluent speech, for example, you know, I've got a high verbal IQ at least, my non-verbal IQ is very low, but I've got a very high verbal IQ, and that's what people see on the surface, because speech is what's, what people tend to kind of notice first, so obviously I am very verbally intelligent, um, and I can speak, my speech is flu fluent, um, but it still might be categorised as a learning difficulty, as autism can offer barriers to learning in a typical classroom. And I thought that's a really interesting way of describing autism, because when we talk about learning difficulties, we of, we're often talking about things like, things like dis, dyscalculia, uh, I've got dyscalculia, that's a maths learning difficulty. Some people, other people might have, say, dyslexia, where they might struggle with reading and writing, or people might have, say, dyspraxia, where they struggle with, you know, motor coordination, um, all of those things are classified as learning difficulties because they affect um, sort of specific areas of learning, not the sort of general learning, but specific areas. But I would say, yeah, that autism could be kind of put under the bracket of a learning difficulty as well. But I would say it's more, it's a more pervasive learning difficulty than those things because autism doesn't just affect one area; it affects like loads of different areas of functioning, and um, and therefore it could have a more pervasive impact on learning in the classroom potentially even in the presence of like a high verbal IQ so I, I would say definitely that also could be considered to be a learning difficulty in some cases maybe not in all cases some autistic people do very well in the classroom and they don't seem to have any academic problems at all but there are a, a lot of autistic people who do really struggle in the classroom and I was one of them but some of that was put some of that's obviously down to the fact I have dyscalculia so I have a specific difficulty with maths and numbers and also spatial relationships and my non-verbal area I struggle non with non-verbal areas of learning so anything involving you know kind of spatial relationships visual spatial learning um, certain areas of kind of practical skill particularly when I'm working under pressure um, and multitasking and all of those things um, impacted me in the classroom and I had um, learning difficulties around comprehension but that could probably relate, be related to my autism and some of it was more like autism specific like obviously um, not understanding instructions because of the kind of communication element and so all of it interlinks um, to kind of give a more pervasive learning difficulty and say um, and a more, yeah, I'll say also could be seen as like a quite pervasive kind of learning difficulty in some cases um, because it can affect learning. So I thought it was quite interesting, and that's and that's even if a person is based in other respects very intelligent, you know. Um, and yeah, and at the end of each chapter in this book, we also have uh, big questions. I put there's, there's, a, there's a bit at the end of each chapter called big questions where it kind of. Uh, um, kind of uh, yeah, there's a list of questions that have been derived from the main kind of uh, uh, the, main, the, main, the main text 
Um, so on page 24, one of the questions posed is, can we envisage a future in which autism leaves the diagnostic manuals altogether becomes a self-determined personal identity? Now, personally, I think that would be a really bad thing because I, I do think that autism needs to have a place in the diagnostic manuals. Autism is a pervasive condition. It affects all areas of your life. It can be very life-limiting for, for some people, not for all people, but many people with autism it really does limit their life, it limits my life, it, it, limit, it, it, it can be really disabling and I do think it needs to be in as an official diagnosis. Um, so I really disagree um, that it should just be a self-determined personal identity and I have talked about this before and I know it's controversial, you're entitled to disagree with me, but you know, I, I am very honest and open in my channel and I think that's important. You know, I respect that some people might disagree with me, that's fine, but I do disagree with self-diagnosis because I think that you, it's fine to say, like, someone to say that they think they might have autism and that they're going to, like, maybe try and, like, get assessed to kind of um, verify that, but to actually say you're autistic without having, without actually being assessed and without actually having that verified by someone else, that doesn't go down well with me because, like, you do need to get it verified by another person, really, because as something as pervasive as autism, there are many other conditions that can overlap with autism as well. And in order to get the right support, you do need to get a proper diagnosis. Um, and 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 like yeah, and like, I just don't think that people can like really know one hundred percent themselves because we're not always the best judge of ourselves. That's why, like you know, it, it would be a bit like someone like. Um, you know, because someone might say, for sake of argument, think that they're the most beautiful or attractive person in the world, or someone might think they're the most ugliest person in the world, but that's pers that's biased, that's objectively biased, you know, we're not always the best judge of ourselves, and particularly when it comes down to something as pervasive as autism, it definitely, I do feel, needs to get that external verification to be absolutely certain. You know, I can never diagnose myself with anything without having it, without knowing, you know, be it through tests or, you know, some other sort of uh, official way of knowing. Um, I can only say, I could only say, you know, I think I might have it, you know, and that was the case before I got diagnosed with autism, you know, I could only say I strongly think I have this and go down the correct path, and it, it can take a long time, you know, diagnosis isn't straightforward, it can take a very long time, and it is very hard, and it should be more available to people, I'm very, I do believe, I, I'm very strongly believe that, you know, we need to make diagnosis easier for people and more available to people, because there are many undiagnosed people out there who are autistic, but haven't yet been um, diagnosed, and I just think that, it needs to be more available to people, but I definitely don't. I definitely do think it should stay in the diagnostic manuals. I'm, I'm, I, I very much disagree that it should just become a self-identity because that kind of just it trivialises autism. It demeans autism. Autism is a serious condition. It can be very disabling, and it needs to be in, a, in an official category just to show that it is a serious condition. Otherwise, people won't take it seriously. So that's my view on that. Um, it does talk about neurodiversity. I've talked about that elsewhere. My views on that. Um, yeah, on page 26, um, it talks about how neurodiversity was conceived as being inherently inclusive. Um, it did not prescribe anything, such as how one should consider your own condition, because it's all about equal rights for all. But then, many now promote a prescriptive paradigm that excludes autistics who find themselves disabled, and that they are told what to believe. And I thought that was really interesting, because, yeah, it says it's how it's a one situation, really, for a movement that's founded on the idea of embracing diversity. Yeah, and I thought that was really interesting, because that's exactly what I feel as well, that um, the actual basic tenets of neurodiversity, you know, I've got absolutely nothing to disagree with. I think it's great, you know, the basic tenets of neurodiversity is a good thing. I'm not against the original premise of a movement, and the fact that everyone is, that we're all diverse and that some people are going to struggle more because their particular neurology doesn't fit into the majority of neurology is something that is to be is, is, is a good place to start in understanding that we're not all the same and obviously if you have a condition like autism or dyspraxia or any of these other deviations from the norm you are in a minority and neurodivergent because everyone's neurodiverse even people who don't have one of these conditions because no one's no brain is the same everyone operates slightly differently but those who are like right at the very end uh, on the out on the out you know on the sort of extreme if you like are, are neurodivergent and um and the fact that we that society needs to accommodate and accept and support people who are neurodivergent more and not punish them is something that can only be encouraged and you know, that we need to encourage a growing acceptance. So I'm 100% behind the original premise 
of a neurodiversity movement, but I have become disillusioned with it and, you know, very critical of it. Um, and I disagree with, with the extremists in the movement because they silence anyone who says that autism is a disability. They silence anyone who says, who's critical of self-diagnosis. They silence anyone who, um, uh, who, who disagrees that autism is a gift. Um, for everyone, obviously, some people those who see it as a gift, that's fine. But yet, yeah, if they silence those who who are who 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 say anything against the established line, um, and 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 they should, you know, and that's I want it because it goes against the original premise, the original idea of the movement, which is that it should it should be encouraging diversity. And obviously, you're going to be seeing a diverse array of different perspectives in autism because autism isn't one thing, and everyone is affected by autism in very different ways. And while for some people their autism might not hold them back that significantly, uh, for others it's really, really disabling. But for some people it is actually a disorder. Not for everyone, but some people do experience it as a disorder. Some people do experience it as a deficit. But you're not allowed to say these words, even if you're only just talking about yourself. If you say autism's deficit, or if you say, for me, get me, or if you say, I wouldn't want to inflict autism on my children, as I heard in one community, people can get quite angry about that and like can, can then say um, that... That, that we shouldn't be talking like that, even though they're only, they're only talking about their own particular situation. And I just think that's really out of order because everyone should be entitled to talk about their autism, their own individual autism, how they see fit. And that's where I have problems now with neurodiversity movement is that it's become incredibly um, narrow and almost totalitarian. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next video to carry on reviewing this book. So moving on to the next video.